there was a particular reading that we had about silence as data and I've that has permanently remained in my head in my mind and soul about how silence can become data and how silence and other forms of emotions pauses as he said um, whatever you want to describe as emotion can become data in the sense that the unsaid the unspoken are louder sometimes even than the spoken and that is what poetry also gets to help us do and as someone who is interested in poetics in the poetics of migration and poetics as a form of telling stories that is something we often deal with the very many things that we pack into words into few words to express an experience so absolutely that's a strong question that you've asked and it has, it's getting us to even think even deeper about how we can be more attentive to the emotions or emotional components of our research, emotional dimensions for emotions, and not necessarily um, emotion as trauma, but emotion as, you know, cheerfulness, emotion as joy, emotion as, you know, celebration, emotion as triumph. So it's a pretty much trial and triumph kind of emotion for me. So yeah, that's that's something we can we can, as Becca said, we can be more attentive to. But yes, from the workshop, the creative expression workshop, that got us to be very much attentive to it. Because I, as we were talking about Dr. Bodens and Michael's presentation, that was packed with emotions. You know, connecting with one's grandmother and the kind of and their lived experiences. You know, had those you know, uh, coded in, you know, in arts. Um, ordinarily, you don't expect people in quants and stats and statistics and quantitative to think creatively. You want them to just go figures and, and you know, numbers, you know, and all of those boring things, you know, around quantitative, you know, I'm sorry to say that. Um, but they were able to make us see that you may be doing science, you may be doing social sciences and statistics, but you can incorporate, you know, the art and creative processes into it. But emotions are very, like, they can be very abstract, and I'd suggest that they are abstract. So to take these abstract emotions that we're looking at in, in our research and to simply just, like, spit them out um, on a piece of paper, I don't think does it justice and it doesn't demonstrate what those emotions are. It's not our job as researchers to decipher necessarily every particular aspect of that emotion, but rather to maybe act as a vehicle in how we sh should think about these emotions or mm -hmm. what these emotions might mean to like broader, like our broader topics. So I think like, like creatively, like, like for example, like silences, like I, I, I have a, uh, I have the same reading for mm -hmm. the semester for my qual class um, and thinking about how we can focus in on those silences and how they are loud, even though they're silences, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and how to express that in a creative way. And I forget that actually the PhD really was that, that a collection, some of it was those moments when I was with my participants, that that really was the essence of my research and that process was really important. And Kyle, um, you were talking about how you might experience or witness someone's a witness, uh, uh, their emotions, but you know we aren't necessarily there to analyze the emotions. So earlier when I was thinking about um, through one of my data collection modes I had invited people to present a uh, creative representation such, of, uh, such as a poem, an image, a drawing, and I couldn't really respond about how I, how I could in interpret those and they were so packed with emotion and maybe really the, the answer is that they sh don't be interpreted with words, they be interpreted with another creative piece that complements, in my case I'm saying complements my dissertation, because uh, at the moment I don't have a way, a way to capture or convey all the emotions that I did get to gather. Language can be so helpful and at the same time so, um, so frustrating to convey certain things. Um, yeah, it's as Becca said. It's very difficult to be able to really do justice to uh, 
creative um, piece, data pieces. Um, yeah, but again, um, I oftentimes also agree with Bath. You know, Bath who said that when when a writer writes, they die. You know, and a writer dies after they write. It is you, the one using what they have written, that takes it up upon yourself to you know analyze to to decode to make meaning of it you know so sometimes even when somebody has given you their art piece or their poem or their whatever they, they don't even see the things you would see you know it's yeah so it's a huge burden you know the burden of analysis is on the researcher you know most times to make sense to how to put on their thinking cap you know their thinking uh, uh, cap to be able to see you know what that person is saying. So that is why I think that creative expression or arts-based methodology is so underrated. It's so underrated, you know, because I don't know why it's probably underrated because it's not the objective science scientific kind of research. But it is packed with a lot of things, you know, that the workshop got us to realize, got us to understand. You know, the researcher is struggling, is dealing with, struggling in a positive way, you know, trying to make sense of what the participants have said or are saying, you know, trying to give, bring out a narrative from, from these, you know. That process itself, you know, can be a lifetime you know, process, you know. So I, I mean, I, I think it's underrated. I mean, it deserves more flowers than it's getting. This moment where you have done this research and you've had a million thoughts, and then you're supposed to like share it, kind of like what you were saying. Mm. Paul is like, what? It feels like this convergent moment where you're like, okay, I need to be able to share mm. all these thoughts that I've had, and maybe that's the wrong shape, but that's what it can feel like when you write your results or you do your thing. Um, and the question for me, or what this workshop reminded me of, is like, how can that feeling, instead of being like, okay, I need to gather all these things and make it into this coherent moment at the end, how can that be like the other shape? Mm -hmm. How can that like uh, be more divergent and just like open things up? Because I think at its best, like art anyway makes like you realize things that you didn't kind of realize before mm -hmm, or something mm -hmm. and and uh, so it's nice to see this work put through like the art filter and seeing how it changes how people kind of think about it or feel about it so yeah and even, the, even with that like art filter I think what was like actually really great about all the presentations is that a lot of the times we are, we, are, we see like the the end result right it's like mm -hmm. this is this is what i did here you go and it's in like a neat little package and we don't see all the steps that were taken mm -hmm. to even come up with the idea so to hear everybody like speak about um why and how they integrated this uh, creative element mm -hmm. into it allowed me to better understand the research more generally because um, yeah. i got all that that, that back story uh, there is this phobia that comes with research findings about I mean phobia the phobia that comes with thinking about how boring it might be especially if you're looking at a thesis of 300 pages 400 pages as, as I'm sure that um, as supervisors and examiners sometimes I wonder how they how they cope sometimes you know <laughs> but I'm, I'm here saying that that's what the workshop you know unveils is how it, the, the, the process can be interesting, you know, how the process can be, as he said, accessible. You know that, that toy for, like, kids where it'll be, like, a bucket, and they have all these shapes, and they got to, like, fit it into it? Now, sometimes if this toy is poorly made, the shapes fit into the wrong <laughs> the, the wrong thing. <laughs> and it, it's, it, it's, it still works out, and, right, like, I've seen, like, I have a, I have a younger cousin who, who plays with this, and I, I see it, and I said, no, it's supposed to go into, into this mm. one, it fits. I'm like... The, no, like, you know, why? <laughs> I was like, I don't know, that, that's just what that made me yeah. think of, like, forcing mm. things to fit so perfectly, and it doesn't always have to 
be that way, and it shouldn't, because sometimes it's that's not yeah, it's not meant to be that way. Um, for me, um, who wasn't doing an arts-based dissertation, uh, my first thought was it takes away the joy, and I think that's because I had just been telling the story of how when I got to the point in my data collection at the interview when I was going to introduce this journal activity, it was a, a moment of joy when I was asking the police officer to write poetry or the emergency operator. I, I, I'm using these as you know, stereotypes of those occupations, not the actual people I was mm -hmm. with. <laughs> but it was disrupting, and because we had a relationship from the interview, it, it was joy. So for me, it definitely would have removed that joy thread and that beautiful layer of um, meaning and that wonderful richness of connection. Earlier I had said that the journal activity had led to me feeling even more connected uh, with my participants because they had been sharing what I thought was, were more intimate details or they were trying to express themselves through different ways which brought its own intimacy out of it. So it would have, it would have robbed me of that. It would have robbed me, I guess, of relationship and that is what I'm going to take away from my PhD, so that would be very, that's a very sad world. If you took a fish out of the water, how do you expect a fish to survive? It won't. So what it means is, again, this brings us to academic freedom. The conversation, the discourse about what is academic freedom. And I like the book, Hawthorne Archives. And the reason I like that book so much is because Avery Gordon tried to make us realize how we can deconstruct academic writing, how we can accommodate reduction, deletion, imposition, all kinds of style in academic writing. And academic writing for ages, I would say, has been inaccessible. And taking away methodology that would make it more accessible is like reproducing that academic bondage. Academic push, institutional pushbacks. That if it is possible, if the institution or if the rules and regulations would allow. I, also, I, I think that these rules and regulations act as impediments for people to think creatively, not even to even do creative stuff, to even think creatively. Somebody drops a, 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 a thinking process because they, they already first think about the impossibility of doing it, such that that thought doesn't even develop. From the university that I came from, I find people from sciences, head sciences, physical sciences, going to grad school to be board director, to be grad, to be chairs of the board, of the board, of the grad school board, to become as associate dean or dean or vice provost, whatever, of the grad school. And they bring their lens of objectivity. They bring their lens of scientific research to make laws that are binding for the whole university. That, for me, is problematic because there are, I come from an adult education background where our methods are different from every other method. And so when I was doing my master's, I remember my supervisor saying, they will throw away your, 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 your paper, your, your proposal. They will say it's, it doesn't go with the objective method. So I think the leadership structure should also be very much be focused on diversity in terms of disciplinary diversity. That disciplinary diversity, I think, is important so that, you know, they can be record. I mean, disciplines can be recognized for their unique and peculiar methods. Yeah, that way there is freedom. Um, something you said, because I can't answer the question directly, but something you were saying about um, uh, people from science backgrounds coming into the university and then trying to impose this lens when really these knowledges and ways of presenting knowledges and poetry have existed for so long, whether or not in some places they've been valued as knowledge and mm -hmm. others not. This is not new knowledge. It's not new ways of doing things. It's mm -hmm. multimodal representation has always existed. It's you who said it. It is the everyday. It is like mm -hmm. all these different languages that just have been decentered and ignored and unvalued. And that's really, r r I guess it's really sad that we've come here and this is where we are. Until we bring in orality, 
back to research. We are just writing for the chefs. Mm -hmm. We're writing for the library chefs. And after maybe 50 years, the library takes them out, burn them, and to create space for new writings. And orality is art-based. Yeah. It's creative. In fact, it is art. So that oral tradition is, that is missing in academia is what I think we need to go back to. I like the idea of, in a, I'm using this word, an oral thesis. I like the idea of doing a thesis that you, I won't have to write down so much, I, I, but will be allowed to say so much about than writing down so many things. How about people who would rather prefer to do a thesis in a recording? What if I want to write my thesis just for a recording? Like I'm using an audio what? Audio file. Audio, mm -hmm. what's that? Record, audio, audio recorder. Audio recorder. What if I want to just speak to an audio recorder for chapter one? And then I move to chapter two, I do the same thing. What if that's how I want to do my research? so that it's more accessible, so that somebody can be driving in their car and be listening to it. So I think that that's a strong question. Because of the coloniality of knowledge that Kuyano emphasized, and the coloniality of power, and Sylvia Winter added another layer, it's coloniality of being. If you think about those layers of coloniality, of knowledge, of power, of being. You think about how academia, there is an article that I'm writing, and this is a strong section of that article, academic fiefdom or freedom. I was asking that question in that article. Is it academic freedom or academic fiefdom? Where a few set of people dictate what is done. So until we take away that bound, those boundaries, that coloniality, because I told somebody recently that each time you put rules and regulations before people, you create coloniality. Like the plantation. Whenever you tell somebody, oh, the rule says this, oh, the, the regulations won't allow you to do this, you're already reproducing coloniality. So I think that, in summary, that until we are able to bring back those missing components, we still continue to reproduce coloniality. It's quite frustrating because we definitely live in a time where the talk of decolonization is so prominent mm -hmm. and we keep talking about it. And this is like many topics, right? We talk about it and then in, I mean, as it was suggested in my mind, because these have been, like oral storytelling mm -hmm. has existed for so long and continues yeah. to exist. and the fact that we're that a lot of institutions don't embrace this in many capacities or don't allow it in many capacities um, is very frustrating because then we have to ask ourselves well how far does this talk of decolonization go right mm -hmm. we're talking about a bit then they have to admit that that there is a stoppage point mm -hmm. and if we really want to to decolonize and I think if if us as not just as researchers but more largely institutions are really dedicated to that than focusing on just creative means of producing knowledge, sharing knowledge, mm -hmm. um, 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 like uh, doing research, these type of ways has to be, I think, at the, at the forefront, if, if we're being honest. Um, there just needs to be more of an exchange with like your, the outer world and yourself and whether that's through story or through, um, just like trying really hard or something and that being the thing where someone's like wow amazing work mm -hmm. look at all of those exchanges that mm -hmm. could be the wrong word mm -hmm. sounds like a stock exchange <laughs> <laughs> but like how did you give so much and, and take so much and give and take and wow holy like that rhythm back and forth and it doesn't always feel like that it can just I think it's mo and everyone has it like in them. That's the frustrating part too. Like, mm. There are professors here and there who are unsettling it. I have to quickly admit that 
that so that we don't generalize there are professors who embrace the social justice lens in academia even though they find themselves in a very colonial space they are unsettling it in their own little ways I share a couple of experience. I think it was, I think there's a prof in this faculty that I heard she told a student, if you're unable to submit an ass a written assignment, do you want to talk about your assignment? And this graduate student said, yes, I would prefer that. And okay, why don't, let's have a meeting. And then you talk about what you always, where you are expected to write down and graded that student based off on what they, they presented, you know. So there are profs here and there, and I, that same student, I understand that when that same student was it was it was an instructor for a course, used that same method for students to say, oh, if you are unable to submit a written paper, yeah, you want to talk about your assignment, why not? Let's book an appointment. So here and there, there are profs who are unsettling this coloniality. But as you, we all know, coloniality has a stronghold. And such that if one person is doing the right thing and is unsettling it, it's like a drop in the ocean. It's not visible on, because of structures. You know, the structures of power, they're very strong, they're very imposing, they're very domineering. You know. So yes, but of, of course there are profs here who are unsettling it.